Hello everyone, today I'm going to talk a little bit about Orban and the EU, also a word or two about uh, President Trump and uh, what happened there, and um, I'm going to conclude by uh, saying a few remarks about the Republican Convention in the United States. First of all about Orban and uh, the EU. I, I kind of feel sorry for Orban, you know, he's, um, this gentleman is trying to get the EU to, to sit down and perhaps think about peace and perhaps um, finding a way to start negotiating and see how we go from here, especially because it is obvious to him and to everyone who's watching that the United States is really trying to leave the Ukraine thing little by little. Yes, they, they are moving on to greener pastures as it were. So they did there what they usually do, they went, they created the thing, the coup, the other thing, the civil war, Okay, and now that it didn't quite work, um, they are ready to leave and pass on the baby to the European Union, or is it perhaps an abortion? This is not uh, a fantastical thing to say, this is what normally happens. They go in, they don't win normally, but then they declare victory and they go home and celebrate. But we can actually see that, for example, J.D. Vance, who might very well become the next Vice President of the United States, has spoken about it very clearly, has written an article in which he actually says to Europe, you know, it's up to you now, he uses the word um, uh, to stop being a client state. That is, those are his words. To actually, you know, take care of yourselves. He's actually telling them. And at this moment, when you can see that the United States is slowly but surely moving on to something else, this is when such an intellectual uh, genius as uh, Kadia Kalas, for example, of Estonia, uh, says, well, if uh, Putin wants the war, he shall have it. <sighs> okay. So, I said I feel sorry for uh, Orban because at the time when he is trying to organize a meeting in Hungary so that the foreign ministers go on hold this meeting, these women are trying to undermine him by organizing other meetings so that they don't go. This is fighting like, it's not even like children. This is so petty. Lesser minds. Petty and ridiculous. And everyone can see it. Their desire also for recognition is clearly outweighs their capacity and their abilities. And so Paul Orban must come out of those meetings with this silly woman feeling as if he has been in a hen house, a chicken coop, you know, being pecked at. <laughs> he must come out of that meeting thinking, oh, gee, has it been pecked all over the place, which is not as bad as what they do with Putin, because with, <laughs> with Putin, this is, this is pecking, you know, but with Putin is, is sheer loathing that they have for him, is that, you know that woman scorn that Shakespeare talked about? And you say to a woman, look, stop bothering me, I don't find you attractive at all, stop calling me, not interested, please leave me alone, oh boy. That's no longer back. They go for your eyes, they want to scratch, yeah, that is what they're doing. Ah, oh, dear, oh dear. 
that uh, Abelina, um, never, Bayopach, whatever the German girl, who went to China and had the audacity to tell them what they must and must not do. Where does she get that audacity from? And the, uh, you know, what she got was a sort of a cold grain from Xi and Xi Jinping. Um, th this is my point. Look, during the Iraq war, you still had some sort of independent leaders in Europe. For example, Bush and Blair uh, wanted to go, but there were other leaders in Europe that decided that they would not go along with that. They considered it illegal. Schroeder in Germany and Chirac in France and Putin in Russia decided not to go along with that. Yeah. And I think that the United States has learned from that experience. First of all, the media was still reasonably free. And so there were a lot of demonstrations in the streets about against the war in Iraq. And they learned from that. So the first thing is that you have to bring the media in. That must not be allowed again. Um, the thing was that you have to enforce allegiance. Certainly in Europe. And so what you had then was a sort of a divide at the time between old Europe, who still felt that they, were, they could speak for themselves, and the new Europe, which was totally allied with the interests of the United States. And many of the Eastern European countries fell into this trap. Don't think they know how to get out of it now. And so these women who for the most part, were carrying the briefcases of their superiors came to power themselves. Um, so anyway, poor Orban, surrounded by hens. Um, I wish him well. Yeah. Moving on to President Trump. He uh, came to the convention and uh, he didn't speak, but uh, I believe he's uh, due to speak Thursday, tomorrow. But uh, everyone noticed, we all noticed, that he was subdued, wasn't he? He didn't have that look in his eyes of, um, you know, wanting to perhaps a more aggressive type of stand, as it were. He was very subdued. And um, why, people are asking, has he, has he changed? I mean, this, this was really something that um, obviously, obviously had to um, left a mark, <laughs> physical and mental and psychological and so on. So. Um, I don't know what lessons he has learned. It could be that he was subdued because of, you know, what had happened, obviously, but also that when that happens, and you come so close to death, a lot of people who have who experience something like that begin to appreciate life more and they always tell us that you know when something terrible happened to them like that um, that they look at life in a different way 
he said he was going to change his speech, uh, which uh, he had been working for a while together with his son, I believe. And he was going to change it. And perhaps uh, uh, people are saying that perhaps it will not be as aggressive as it was going to be. Not because of fear, just because of a certain perhaps wiser realization that uh, things have got to a point where America has in some way have to come together in some way. In other words, he might be, his being so subdued might be also to the fact that hopefully he feels, okay, um, what can I do now? I mean, we have reached such a point that I don't know where we're going to get from here. So perhaps try to unite the country in some sort of way. That could be too. Um, I will be very interested uh, in, in hearing him speak, because that's going to tell us if things are going to change and to what degree they're going to change. Um, the United States uh, is quite a history, you know, of assassinating or attempts to assassinate a president. I think four or five, right? And uh, the last attempt was with Reagan in the 80s. And, you know, I have been thinking about whether Nixon's uh, Watergate and uh, his resignation and so on was not also a little bit of a coup. I know about uh, Watergate. I lived through it. Wasn't paying too much attention to the details at the time. So, but... Um, it just seems now, looking back, that the fact that some Republican oper operatives um, burgled the Democratic Party headquarters and it all ended like that, it seems a little bit strange. I'm just thinking whether that would have been also a, a sort of what we now say a false flag kind of thing. I might be totally wrong on this. But I, I, I actually think about that because, you see, what has changed from what we knew at the time is that Bernstein, one of the reporters, you know, you know the movie or the President's Men and all that, and they were independent. No, Bernstein was a CIA agent. It is known now, yeah? He had been in the, is it CIA or FBI, whatever, okay? And then from there, he went to the Washington Post. And he was the one who was being told and he was investigating and so on. But when you know that he was CIA or FBI, whatever it was, that changes quite a bit. So, um, the Civil War, the Civil War, was it a civil war really? Because in a civil war, you have brother against brother and mother against son and so on because they that, you know, everything is mixed. This was the, the North against the South. It was not really a civil war as we define civil war. The South thinking that they had the, uh, the right to secede from the Union, which in fact, if you looked at the Constitution, they did, in fact. The, uh, the, um, the states, the, the union was a voluntary thing, and the states had much more power at the time. 
and the country changed because of that and uh, the rest of the world changed too. Um, what we are seeing here, you see, is that the United States is at uh, crossroads in a civilization context. Democracy works fairly well when things are easy, but when a major thing happens in chaos and, and uh, disasters and so on, it's um, a lot of people are willing to throw away the cards or cheat at cards. It's when things get complicated. Uh, where you can see how they are handled, whether you are in really in democracy or not. Um, the yes, it's a, it's a, it's a civilized a civilizational uh, change that is uh, going on at the moment because they the the masters. Uh, the global um, cabal are in a state of panic, as we said so many times, in a state of panic because they have lost the emerging world, developing world, as we used to call it. And they are in a state of panic because they might, they might lose the West too. And that cannot happen. This victory of Russia, for example, is unacceptable to them. And so they are fearful of what might happen. What Russia did to the oligarchs, could that start happening to them? Not to them, the ones who, who pulled the strings, but the obvious ones, the politicians and so on. This is not far-fetched because even Hillary Clinton, I believe, uh, it was uh, Hillary Clinton who said, if things continue the way they're going, we could all, we, they, we could all end up hanging by streetlights. You see, if you let the West start expressing, the people start expressing themselves freely, things could get out of hand for them. Russia did it with its oligarchs. Could that happen here too? And for most of us, not the ones at the top, they'll be okay because they'll just retreat for a while. But the obvious, the, the ones that we can see, their minions, what will happen to them? Um, So they must be, they, they might be actually targeting their own population. And they count for that in something like anticipatory obedience from all of us. They tried it and it worked. Okay, let's move on to the convention. Oh my goodness. First of all, I can't find myself listening to each one of the speakers because it's just so boring. They all say the same, say the same, the same cliches. If I hear about the shining city on a hill. I'm going to just puke. Okay, the usual thing. Yes, I came to, my parents came to this country with nothing but their shirts on. But now you see the American dream. And here I am, a billionaire. And <laughs> climbing Everest. And <laughs> 
Oh gosh, it's it's just uh, it's it's very old. Fun. Couldn't they do it in a different way, like interviewing, um, you know, long form interviews, getting to think what these people think and the way they're going to lead the country instead of all these cliches. It's just it's just so boring. Another thing that I noticed, actually, I didn't notice it myself. I when I uh, I think it was the first day and I started watching from the very beginning and I see that uh, oh now for a invocation or a prayer they always start with the, the prayer with this uh, pasta the other one with this anyway and they were and then they said and now for benediction by a woman's name and I thought no I don't want to be benedicted by any uh, fake priest here and uh, or priestess and I just switched it off moved on uh, forward and so on well later I learned from uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall that it was actually a prayer to some he says pagan god I believe it was um, to a Christian at any, at any rate it was uh, the Sheik religion uh, this is not a good idea. First of all, it's all these, these, all these pastors and all these priests coming along and this and that. It, it's beginning to look programmed. It, it's beginning to look like a little bit of a farce, like everything else. Okay. Since there is a separation of church and state and all that, I would suggest that it would be better if they don't bring any one of these pastors on. If you want to pray, pray in private. Um, but this whole thing about no... But also the fact that if you bring a chic priestess, to do some benefit. You know what is going to happen? Now all the other religions from all over the world will also have to be represented. Otherwise you will be discriminating. And when you get to that point, then you can also bring the Church of Satan and the Church of this or any other religion. Oh, but this is my religion. You are discriminating. It's a never ending thing. So just do away with this farce of using religion as a political tool, please. And another thing that I noticed was that it seemed to me, I can understand it, but it seemed to me a little bit um, too dangerous and that was the of the open and obvious stand pro Israel. There is a battle going on in the Middle East between Israel and the Palestinians. Okay, a lot of people in the United States have uh, demonstrated against not the Jewish religion, but the state of Israel. Fine. Okay, but. If you have a speaker there saying, you know, we are on this side and so on, and then others too, what you are saying to all those people who were not going to vote for Biden and the Democrats on this issue because they disagree with him, you just left them with nowhere else to go. Because you're obviously saying, we, the Republican Party, we are on this side. And I think that that was done on purpose. I think they sneaked it in in order to flatfoot the Republicans. I think this is done on purpose. It's not that something it, someone is not paying attention. And I don't think they can see it. They can't see about the, the dangers of introducing a pagan god. 
because they were still with this, oh, let's all, we're all the same. No. They're not changing. In other words, the, the, their opponents are two, three, four steps ahead of them. So they haven't learned. I don't know whether President Trump, uh, after this, will be more aware of who his enemies are. Because the Republican Party is not. I leave it there for today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.